Hi, I'm Scott. Welcome to Scott's Synth Stuff. On this series, we go through all the synthesizers I own from the simplest to the most complex in order. Today in episode five, we feature one of the synths that's had probably more requests than pretty much all the others. It's the Roland System 8. Coming up next. So everybody knows the Roland Jupiter 8. It's the granddaddy of analog synths. It's the one that everyone wants. They are far and few between, and they are unbelievably expensive. $35,000 for a working Jupiter 8 today. So yes, I'd love to have a Jupiter 8 just because of the sounds, but it's not going to happen. I'm not spending that kind of money on a synthesizer. You got to be nuts. So how about a Juno 106? That's another popular Roland analog synth from the 80s. It has some really epic sounds, been used in tons and tons of music throughout the years. $2,500 for a 40-year-old synth. Not bad, but I mean, yes, $2,500 will get you a lot more synthesizer today than a simple little six-voice analog synth from 1986, was it, I think? How about a Roland JX3P? $1,500, but you know, it's pretty limited in terms of a synth. And again, for $1,500, you can get a lot more synthesizer today. Speaking of $1,500, how about the Roland System 8? The $1,500 System 8 is an entirely digital synthesizer, but it's a virtual analog synthesizer. So it emulates an analog synthesizer. It works like, thinks like, it basically is an analog synthesizer as far as you know, but underneath the covers, it's fully digital. There's DSPs in there that are emulating what an analog synth does in order to create sound. And with a very few exceptions, it's completely indistinguishable from an analog synthesizer, even though it's entirely digital. The native System 8 synthesizer is a very capable synth with powerful FM and full analog capability. but its secret weapon is these three buttons here. Plugouts. What you can do is actually load emulations of other synthesizers into it. And from the factory, it comes with three already loaded. A Jupiter 8, a Juno 106, and a JX3P. These are not just any old emulations. Unlike Roland's current offering, which is Zencore ABM, which is analog behavior modeling, Zencore ABM means it takes a look at the existing Jupiter or Juno 106 or analog synthesizers and it looks at the outputs of them and it says, okay, how can we emulate what those things do digitally? So they design algorithms that basically simulate the sound that's coming out of those old synthesizers. It's pretty close, not perfect, but it's, it's not bad. It it's definitely sounds like those original instruments. The System 8 is different. The System 8 uses ACB, analog circuit behavior. It's a lot more costly. It takes a lot more processing hardware to do. And the reason why is because it's not just modeling the behavior of the synthesizers, it's actually modeling the circuitry in the synthesizers. So what they did is they took the Jupiter 8 synthesizer, they took the circuit diagram, the schematic diagram, and they modeled every little resistor, transistor, diode, capacitor, they modeled the performance of each of those components and they put that into the computer. So the computer inside the synthesizer is literally running an emulation or a simulation of the actual electronics of those original synthesizers. And for that reason, the ACB analog circuit behavior modeling engine in the System 8 is incredibly accurate. You can look up side-by-side -side tests on YouTube where people have taken this synthesizer and put it up against the original unit and put the same patch into both, and the sounds are absolutely indistinguishable. So this is my Jupiter 8. Here's why I bought this. I wanted a Jupiter 8. I can't afford a Jupiter 8. I can afford a System 8, and uh, as a bonus, I get a Juno 106 and JX3P. I bought this for Jupiter 8. Funny enough, I actually don't use the Jupiter 8 engine in this all that much. That little opening you heard me play in there, that was Jupiter 8 engine playing. However, 
The System 8 engine in this is so powerful, I find that I end up using it most of the time. And those three plugouts, the Jupiter 8, Juno 106, and the JX3P, I actually find that I prefer the Juno 106 emulation. That's the one I find I use most often in terms of the old analog synth emulations. And just because there's three plug-out synths in here now, it doesn't mean that's what you have to live with. You can actually go on Rolling Cloud and download other plug-out synths into these slots. You can get a Juno 60, ProMars, SH2, SH101. I think you can even get a System 100, and it will actually take the circuitry of those synthesizers, bundled up into a plug-out, and actually transfer it in here so you can actually play your SH101 on this synthesizer. Of course, you have to purchase those from Rolling Cloud, but if you ever get sick of it, you can actually just remove it. And if you factory reset, these three original ones come back again. And once you've purchased it, it's yours for life. So if you want to have several that you just pop in and out as you need, you can do that. It's an eight voice synthesizer, but that's one of the nice features is that you have eight voices. So if you have a, a, an emulation of an older synth that maybe only had four voices, well, guess what? Now you have eight. So if you have a JX3P, which I believe is four voice from the factory, or is it six? Uh, maybe it's six. So when you play the plugin in here, it actually emulates as if it had extra voice boards, so you get full eight voices. The native System 8 engine that's in this synthesizer is actually also available on Rolling Cloud. So if you, you just like the sound of the System 8 engine and the features that it has, you don't want to buy the hardware, you can actually get that plug-in as a, as a soft synth on Rolling Cloud, and it has all the features of the System 8. Now, this analog circuit behavior is actually common to the ERA line, so the System 8, the System 1, the TR-8S all use that analog circuit behavior, whereas the Jupiter X, Jupiter XM, the Phantom all use the Zencore analog behavior modeling system. One of the things you can actually do in this is modify the age of the circuitry, so you can alter a setting in here that tells it, okay, I want you to pretend or it change the model that it's running so that my Jupiter 8 is behaving as if it were 20 years old. So as the capacitors start to age, the, you know, things start to drift, the sound changes. So if you want this to sound like a brand new Jupiter 8 as it came from the factory, you can do that. If you want one that sounds like it's been sitting in a barn for 30 years and you just turned it on, it'll do that too. Now, you'll notice there's a lot of controls across here. I really like that. It makes it really easy to do sound design on this. It's not quite knob per function, but it's very close. And the controls that are not represented by physical knobs on here are in the menu. And the menu is not too deep. It's only one or two layers deep, so you don't have to do a whole lot of menu diving. It's not too tough to find. And the stuff that is in the menu is things that you really don't use that often. Now, obviously, the controls on this are laid out for the, the native System 8 engine, and they can't necessarily have the controls that would work for, for instance, a Juno 60. The Juno 60 emulation only came out this year, so obviously when they made this, they, they can't know how to map the controls to synthesizers that they don't have an emulation for yet. So what they do is they have mappings between these controls. Now, some of these are obvious. You know, the, the filter controls are going to map to the filter controls on the, on the plugouts. Uh, some of them are not so obvious, especially when the, the originals have a little bit of uh, custom or, or unique features. It helps you out, so when you select a different plug out, the panel lights up on the top here and shows you what controls are actually active. So obviously the Juno 106 doesn't have a second oscillator, so the second oscillator lights turn out to tell you, hey, these controls don't do anything in this mode. They also give you a parameter correspondence cheat sheet that you can print out that shows here's a picture of the original panel and here's a picture that maps onto the System 8 panel. So I can say, well, I want to change uh, the VCO here. It's number 11. And so I go, okay, number 11 is actually oscillator one, this control. So, and then of course it gives you details. And the same thing for the Juno 106 and the JX3P. And the nice thing about the JX3P Obviously, the JX3P was back when they were trying to fight the DX7, and the, the big thing in the 1980s was to just all digital buttons and very little controls. So what they did is they had the Roland PG200, which is a, a little module that you could plug into your JX3P. They had a whole bunch of knobs, so it was easier to program. And they've actually emulated that PG200 in the plug-out for the System 8. 
Like I said, it's entirely digital. It's not analog, but you would never know it. it this thing sounds so fat and warm. If you didn't know that this was actually a digital synth, you would swear that this is analog. Let's see if I'll switch the uh, Juno 106 and we'll just pick a patch at random. It sounds very analog. And because it has all these great plugouts in it from the 80s, this thing is absolutely perfectly suited to do 80s type music. If your band is doing 80s cover songs, this thing is a no brainer. This, along with a DX7 or maybe a Modi X, which can do all the DX7 and actually play DX7 patches, between those two synthesizers, you've got the 80s covered. You, there's pretty much nothing in, from the 80s that you can't do with this and a DX7. If you just want to work in that type of analog style, I know a lot of current EDM has 80s type synths in it. Again, this is your man right here. And like those 80s poly synths, like the Jupiter 8, it's bitambral. So you can actually split or layer the keyboard so you can have two sounds at the same time, two different patches. Uh, something you can do on this that you can't do on those old synths, so you can mix and mash between the engines. So if I want a Jupiter 8 bass with a Juno 106 top end, or maybe I want the System 8 engine on the bottom and I want a JX3P up top, or maybe I want to blend, uh, I don't know, a couple different pads. Like I have a Juno 106 pad on top of a Jupiter 8 pad playing all at the same time. You can do that on this. When you do split it like that, just like the Jupiter 8, your, ha your voice count is halved. So if you have two different sounds, each half, each sound gets four voices. Now you saw me select a patch here. This is the very typical Roland patch select system, just like on the Jupiter 8. It gives you a measly 64 patches per engine, which really, it sucks. That's the thing I really dislike most about this is the very, very limited patch storage and the, the very limited way that you can actually get patches in and out of this. I really wish it had eight times that storage because I would definitely be able to fill it up. I'm constantly having to delete good sounds out of this because I need to save a new sound that I've created. Now on synths where I have thousands of available slots, that's a no-brainer. I just leave those old ones in there. Who cares? I'm, you know, I'll never use them. But on this one, <laughs> there are not a whole lot of factory patches left in here because I've overwritten them with my own stuff. And that's a shame because some of the factory patches on this were really good. And I really like being able to go through and, and you know, go through presets and find something close that to what I want. And maybe I can tweak it a bit. And that's generally how I work. The other limitation on this is that there's no real categorization. Most modern synths, you can say, OK, let me search through all the pads or let me search through all the pluck sounds or, or that sort of thing. Uh, so it kind of categorizes it down. This, they, when they named the patches in this, they put like a PD at the front for a pad or BS for bass. So you can tell what the patch is as you're scrolling through before you play it. But there's no way of saying, hey, show me just the bass sounds. And of course, there's not that many patches to actually go through. So it would be nice if you had a lot more patch storage and a lot better way of finding patches that you could wanted to use. It does have a somewhat limited but functional arpeggiator and it has a step sequencer which is the typical Roland TRX step sequencer although with a, a little bit extra kind of like the JDXI we'll have a look at that in a minute first thing we'll have a look at is the control section which applies to all the engines so we have volume which is the overall volume you have an analog input that can either be line level or a microphone and a peak if you're over peaking that and we do have a vocoder the vocoder is actually fairly capable. You can adjust it for uh, consonants and formants simply by turning the input on. Anything we say in the microphone will come out over the outputs. But as soon as we switch on the vocoder, now as we talk, it plays through the vocoder. 
Vocoder works good if you have a lot of resonance and bring up lots, lots of upper end because then it makes it a little more intelligible. This is the vocoder talking through the microphone. And here is how it sounds. So it's a pretty usable vocoder. You have the standard pitch band and modulation you see on every Roland synth. You can adjust what these do. The pitch bender, you can have it affect the pitch or filter. And same thing with the mod wheel, you can have it affect the pitch or filter and the depth of the effect is set with these sliders. And those are saved per patch. Okay, other controls that we have that affect every engine. Arpeggiator, we have a fairly simple arpeggiator. We have either one or two octave and we have up, up and down, or just down. We can have quarter to sixteenth or quarter triple through one sixteenth. We also have key hold, which is helpful for doing sound design. It just basically latches anything you press. Chord memory memorizes any chord that we press. So if I press and hold chord memory and play a C minor, now if I just press that one key, I get that same C minor. If I go down, it obviously just uses that chord throughout. When we have a patch that has velocity, such as this one, we can actually turn that off with the velocity off button. And it plays every note as if it's at maximum velocity. It does have only 49 keys, so we have the obligatory transpose up and down. We can also transpose by semitones. By pressing transpose and then at the same time pressing down or up, we can transpose by semitones. However, Whatever reason, and you can see a change on the display here, Roland has only allowed us to transpose up six semitones and down five. Why? Why doesn't Roland just do something sensible like let us go to maybe, I don't know, 12 semitones, whole octave? It would make far more sense. In any case, if you're slightly out of tune or you're, well, more likely your guitarist is out of tune or they're playing something in a slightly different key, you can adjust this to, to suit. Now we're in patch mode here. We're playing sounds from the patch memory. At, when we select a patch, it plays all the settings from that patch and the controls are ignored. Now if I move one of these controls, it will immediately take effect. So if I change oscillator 1 to, I don't know, a variation, you can see it's going to change that. So if I'll go back to the original. Um, these controls don't actually affect the patch until you actually move them. Now you can actually press the shift button and move any control and it will show you what the value is here. So if I sh press shift and move filter cutoff, it shows the filter cutoff for this patch is 138. The, res the, the resonance is 105. Um, that's handy so you can figure out how a patch is actually made because you can see what the actual values are. If I go to manual mode, it ignores what's in the patch and all the controls take effect. So whatever the controls are set to is what you hear. Now that's patch mode where one patch is across the entire keyboard. We have eight voices. We also have performance mode. The performance mode is our Jupiter 8 mode where we have it's by timbral. We can have two sounds from two different engines and you can either split them across the keyboard or layer them. I believe this one has a layered sound, so it will play both the, the pad and the arpeggio at the same time. Now, for whatever reason, Roland works differently from the rest of the world, whereas most synthesizers, you have patches and you have patch memory 
like this one here, where you can just select the patches from, you know, A2, there's the sound A1, and then you have a performance where you have a whole set of different patches that you can select. And that's completely separate from the original patches. Roland works completely differently. Roland likes to do their own thing. So the performance mode on this is actually just pointing to existing patches. So performance A2, for instance, it might, we can say, well, the, the, the first half or the lower of this is actually patch A1 from the System 8 and the upper is patch C7 from the Juno 106 or whatever. But the point is that if you change the patch that it's pointing to, it also changes the performance because it's not actually storing a copy of the patch, it's just storing a reference that points to that patch. So the problem is I've got all these performances in here that came in with it from the factory, but because I've gone in and changed all those patches because I don't have enough room because there's only 64 patches per engine, now all these, these performances are ruined because the, the patches that they used to point to have been changed. So just a stupid moronic decision for, by Roland to do that. Other synthesizers like the, the Summit you see down here below, I don't know if you can't see, but this one down here below, it actually stores its performances separately. So you actually get extra patches. So the performances don't get affected if you change patches because it stores the actual patch as part of the performance, whereas this one just stores a reference to the existing patch. Stupid. Anyway, so you can turn off the lower and upper parts of a performance. Here's the lower one. So here, that's the pad. Upper is obviously the arpeggiator. Um, you can also change, you look and see what the panel is. So if we look, press lower, here's the panel for the lower part. Now we're looking at the panel for the upper part. So if I wanted to, let's see, if we just listen to the upper part, which is the arpeggios, and I wanted to change the, know, the filter on that. So that obviously affected this. Now, if I go to the panel select lower and listen to the lower, it hasn't been affected. But now, because I've selected the lower on the panel select, I can affect it as well. So now if I play both, you'll hear them both been affected. So that's how you edit performance. So you can edit the, the patches with that performance. We have portamento that you can turn on so it glides from note to note. We can turn on legato mode so it only does that if you actually play it legato. So if I overlap my notes. But if I let go in between. That's not a, a unique synth feature. Most synths have that. Here's our tempo that affects the arpeggiator and the sequencer. Uh, you can also sync it to the LFO and the delay to the tempo. So if we turn tempo sync on, our delay will then sync to this tempo here. And this tempo here is actually also going to sync to your external MIDI if you were sending a clock. Here we can adjust the voices here. When it's off, we have polyphonic. On, it's mono. Only one note. If we push it again, it's flashing unison. It plays all eight voices simultaneously. Give you a much big, thicker voice. You don't really hear that here. If I go into, uh, say, a Jupiter 8, uh, okay, there's a nice poly patch on the Jupiter 8, nice strings. If I go into unison mode, you can hear how big and thick that gets. Up here, you just saw me use the plug out to switch to Jupiter 8. Uh, here's our, our Juno 106 JX3P, and, and then you get a separate set of patches. And the menuing system. Uh, it's not bad as far as menus go. Um, it's not very deep. You have w one main menu, and then if you enter into each one, it'll show you. you know, here you can see what plugouts I have loaded in. Um, for most part, the menuing system you just use once in a while and you set it and forget it. If you get into really complex editing, if you're into the effects and you want to start editing side chains and your reverb and whatnot, then you got to go into the menuing. But for the most part, I never even use the edit, the menu editing. And of course, the shift button, as I mentioned, you get your alternate values and it also used to uh, look at existing values. Over here, we have a patch selection area. 
to simply go through your patches A through H and then one through A. So we have A1 is... That's, uh, we're in Jupiter here right now. Let's pick uh, another one. Okay, so we have a poly stack sound on the Jupiter 8. So that's all there is to this. Uh, you can actually write uh, patches by hitting the write button over here. So if we change this patch, we want to write back. We can change the name of the patch and, and write, just decide where we're going to store it and so on. This is also used for the step sequencer. This is a typical TRREC Roland step sequencer with a little bit of added functionality, kind of like JDXI. We can do step recording, real-time recording. I find the real-time recording is pretty much useless for playing into it because there's no click. Uh, you really have to go by the lights and that's kind of useless. There's other reasons to use this and I'll show you in a moment. So typically I'll use the step recording. Um, scale changes the speed of the step according to the tempo. Right now we're at 1 16th, so each, each step will be 1 16th of a, a step. You can change the play mode um, from going forwards, backwards, ba bounce back and forth. Uh, what is this one called? Uh, invert. Where it jerk, jerks back and forth. Uh, random, which is nice. And key trigger, which basically means it doesn't, it only plays the sequencer as long as you hold the key down. The random is kind of what you heard in every Duran Duran song from the 80s. You had Nick Rhodes in there on his Jupiter 8 in random mode. And it's, think of um, uh, Rio and you hear that doo -doo 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 -doo, playing all kinds of random notes. Let's record in the sequencer. First, I will erase and you'll see it says sequence erase all enter. So I'll hit enter and I'll say sure. OK, so we've now erased our sequence in here. We have nothing. So let's step record something into here. So we'll just hit step record and OK, uh, so obviously it's now on step 17. Uh, I recorded only 16. You can have up to 64 steps. Uh, let's change the length. So if I hit length here and you can see it's this one's actually default as 64. So let's change that down to 16. OK, enter. So there now we have our 16. Um, so if we exit there, if we hit start, we should be able to hear our sequence. And you can kill one of the steps or more, just like every Roland. Play every Roland sequencer. Okay, one of the real nice things about, about the sequencer is that it records not just notes, but controls. And you can record up to four controls per step. So for that, I'm going to go to real-time recording. So let's hit start. It's now playing. And I will hit real-time record and adjust the cutoff. And as you can hear, it's recorded my movement of the cutoff frequency and it's playing it back as part of the sequence. And if I want to, hit step record and let's say uh, on this one, I actually wanted to play something else. Now, you can actually record a chord. It doesn't have to be a single note. So let's play that. And let's say, so we step record here and we'll play Listen to that. That sounds terrible, but you get the idea. As we hit the different notes in step record, you can actually see what notes we played over here. And if we do have more than 16 steps recorded in here, just by pressing shift, you can then pick which one of the four. So 1 through 16, 17 through 32, and so on. You can quickly get to the four banks of 16 that way. So as this is playing, if we hold down edit and press another key, it actually transposes what it, key it's playing it in. And if we are playing this as a part of a performance where we have two separate parts, by pressing edit and then part upper and lower, it will actually mute 
either that upper or lower part out of the sequence. All right, let's go through the synthesizer engine part. Now, I'm not going to go through this for each model, and I'm going to only kind of go through this rather briefly because we could spend absolutely hours going through all the different functionality in this synthesizer because it's just so capable and so powerful. I'm going to talk about the System 8 synthesizer. If you notice, like, System 8, we have oscillator 1 and 2 with a sub-oscillator. On Jupiter 8, there is no sub-oscillator, so these lights go out. Um, similarly, if we GX3P, you can see we don't get the coarse tune. And so whatever functions don't apply for that synthesizer, the lights go out. So let's go to System 8. System 8, we have an LFO. Now, unlike most synthesizers, this synthesizer has a single LFO, which you would think is a limitation, but it's, it's actually... They've, they've done some clever things to get around it. So we have various waveforms. We have sine, uh, triangle, sawtooth, square wave, uh, sample and hold, and random. Um, the fade time is how long after you trigger the LFO does it actually start oscillating, and the rate for the LFO. Um, this is a key trigger that says the LFO triggers at the beginning of each key, so that way you don't play something and have the LFO start in the middle of a phase. The trigger envelope basically means Every time the LFO triggers, if this is turned on, it will re-trigger the amplitude envelope for the, the amplitude. Uh, that way you can have it re-trigger the amplitude, the ADSR envelope, over and over and over every time the LFO cycles. Okay, so uh, we have variation here, which varies the waveforms and functionality. Variation 1 is standard single LFO like you see here. Variation 2 gives two LFOs, but the second LFO is applied like FM towards LFO1. As you can see, the LFO light is kind of speeding up and slowing down here in a way, like a frequency modulation type manner. And so the LFO gets faster and slower and faster and slower. Variation 3, uh, we get a pulse waveform with resonance and the, and the waveform actually changes the resonance. Very complex, used for FM. I'm not going to go into it here. So there is no mod matrix on this synthesizer. Instead, the LFO has three knobs that allow you to the, apply the LFO to either the pitch, filter, or amplifier section in a positive or negative fashion. So, so let me hold a key here. Okay, so if I hold down a key and then I apply the LFO to pitch, obviously it's now affecting pitch. I can also affect amplitude and filter. So that's how the LFO is used to affect different things. And obviously, if we have uh, Variation 2 where we have F FM... And there's where our FM starts coming into play. And you can get some f freaky sounds out of this just by using the LFO in that way. Okay, very powerful. I'm not going to go in a whole lot more onto it because it gets very complex. Oscillator 1, Oscillator 2, essentially identical. You have a saw, square wave, triangle, a super saw, a super square, and a super triangle. So we can hear those if I turn off everything but Oscillator 1 in the mixer. Sawtooth, square. Just like the LFO, we have variations up to four. One is what you see is what you get. The, the, the waveform is printed right on there. Number two, three, and four gives FM and, and a bunch of different types. Again, I'm not going to go into these because it, it gets really complex in the, in the way the FM is done on here. If you're really interested, you can go to Roland and download their reference manual and it's... Uh, Actually, Roland manuals are typically crap, but the Roland manual for this synth is actually not bad at all. Um, and it will go into depth into how they've implemented FM on this synthesizer. Uh, color adjusts different things depending on what you've selected. For the basic tone here, just adjust the, the color. 
kind of a brightness. In different variations, it adjusts different things. The mod here changes the source that is modulated by the color. So you can modulate this color value. Manual, manual is basically this knob here, or you can have the LFO modulate it, or the pitch envelope, filter envelope, amplitude envelope, or you can actually have oscillator 3 modulate the color here. So again, you can get more FM out of this. So you can see the LFO here. If I switch this to LFO, you can hear the LFO is now modulating the color. Here, off and on, so you can hear the difference. You have uh, different octaves you can actually set this to. Coarse and fine tune, so you can detune. The cross mod modulates oscillator one frequency from oscillator two, so. Again, FM, I'm not gonna try to talk about FM programming, it's way out of scope for this video. Oscillator two, Identical to oscillator one, except we have ring and sync. Ring, uh, it takes oscillator one and oscillator two, takes the values from both and mul multiplies them together, and that's what you get. So you get some, oh, yeah, here. Sync resets oscillator 2's cycle every time oscillator 1 finishes. So oscillator 1 is running a, a cycle, a waveform, and every time it finishes, it doesn't care how far oscillator 2 is through its cycle, it resets oscillator 2 as well, and it gives it a really hard sound that I think you're going to recognize. So if we have this going, and if I do the same thing with the sync on, So that's sync. Then we have a sub oscillator, which is a, a little bit limited. We have a, either a sine wave, one or two octaves, at the same pitch or one octaves or two octaves lower. Simple sine wave. And then we have a triangle wave. We can also adjust the color of that. Over here we have a mixer, just adjust the, the different levels of oscillator 1, 2, and the sub oscillator 3. And then we also have a separate noise oscillator right here. White noise or pink noise. If the light's on, it's white noise. If it's off, it's pink. That's good for drums or you can add it to the beginning of a, a sound. We have a pitch envelope over here where we can adjust the attack and decay. Then we get to the filters. The filters are extremely powerful in this synthesizer. Uh, the variants, I'll, you can see here, we have variation one through eight. So variation one is your standard low pass, high pass filter. Number two, you get a sideband filter. Number three, you get the, si the low pass filter from the Roland System One. Uh, number four, is the Jupiter 8 filter. Number five is the Juno 106 filter. Uh, six and seven are both formant filters. The difference is number six is between two vowels and seven is between three. And eight gives you a harmonic filter. So if we, you can hear. Nice uh, formant filter there. Um, I won't go into all the different functions of the different filters because it's there's just far too much. There's so much functionality in the filters in this. Again, go read the documentation if you're interested. So we'll just talk about the simple uh, basic filter one, variation one, cutoff, resonance, and we can affect the envelope, which is this section here, positive or negative. Key tracking is how much the filter opens up depending on how high we play the keyboard. So obviously the filter you want higher frequencies, you want the filter to open higher up, so let those higher frequencies through. 
Uh, and of course, the envelope is how much this envelope here affects the filter. We have a high pass cutoff. So here we have a, you know, right now we're doing a low pass, or are we? <laughs> We also have a high pass so we can affect. So we can, in effect, you can create a band pass filter with this. Velocity sensitive, the harder you hit the key, the more the filter opens up. Then we have all the different filters. We have a, a 24 decibel uh, low pass, 18 decibel slope, and 12 decibel slope low pass. We have a 12, 18, and 24 decibel high pass, which we can affect the cutoff of the high pass. Very powerful filter. Again, I'm not going to go into it a lot more because there is so much this to this. Aha! Now we found one of the limitations of this, this synth. If you listen to that resonance... If you have worked with digital audio, you will recognize that is quantization noise. That is not the correct behavior for a filter you should be hearing a very high frequency that's going up and, and, you know, into sounds that only dogs can hear. The reason you're hearing that strange noise is because the processor in this is not quite fast enough to be able to process the, the information required for these high frequency resonances. So instead, you get this quantization noise, which is similar to when you hear like a, an old style 8-bit sampler and you're playing high frequency sounds into it that are above the Nyquist frequency for that sampler. Same idea. You get the same thing when you play really, really high notes on this. You get some, some sampling noise, or, or rather quantization noise. Okay, so enough of the filter. Uh, and, uh, the amplitude envelope, very, very simple. Uh, adjust the velocity sensor of the key, so, it's, it, so it plays louder when you hit it harder. You can adjust the tone, which is just like a, a overall brightness, and then the level of the envelope. So how much how much of this is affecting the sound? So if you turn this off, this basically is, is inactive. You get nothing. So I can adjust the, the attack and we just adjust the release on that. We'll do the same thing over here. So that's our amplitude. It's a very bog standard ADSR envelope. Okay, lastly, the effects. We have three separate effects. We can actually run the external audio in through these effects if we want. Um, they are digital effects. They're, they're not, not bad. They're not the greatest effects I've ever heard, but they're, they're definitely usable. So we have uh, this effect here. We have overdrive, distortion, metal, fuzz, uh, CR. Uh, I don't remember CR is, but pH is phase. Okay, so overdrive, tone and depth. Definitely hear some overdrive there. Distortion. Distortion is a great way to get the sound to cut through the mix without actually increasing the level because it just it it just makes that sound punch through the mix. Metal sound. This to me sounds just like distortion. Fuzz. Different kind of distortion. The mysterious CR, whatever that is. And I hear more quantization noise in there. Oh, bit crusher. That's what that is. That's why we're hearing quantization noise, because it's supposed to be quantization noise. CR is bit crusher where it's actually intentionally adding quantization noise. And we have a phaser. Okay, very nice. Okay, then we have a delay. Time. And I need a different sound that is more plucky. With less release. And it is a true delay where you can adjust the time you hear it, emulate that analog tape effect. You can actually sync the delay to the tempo by pressing the tempo sync over the left. And we have a pan, which is like a, a ping pong. So 
So we get nice. We can get a chorus. And second chorus. actually have delay and chorus together. Obviously we're not hearing delay because I'm playing a pad right now. That's just such a nice sound. Okay, let's turn that off for a moment and listen to our reverb. Okay, so I've got a nice little plucky sound playing. Okay, so now let's bring up our ambient. It's a small room ambience, a larger room, a hall, second hall, a plate reverb, and a modulated reverb. I end up using one of the two halls most of the time. If we add in delay there. Now, as I mentioned, those effects, what I showed you there is just the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more into the effects. Uh, if you dive into the menu, uh, you can adjust, you can do side chaining, you can adjust every aspect of the, the you can change wet, dry, you can change room size and just like there's so much you can change in the effects um that you i mean you have only nine knobs there but there's probably three four times that number of controls that you can actually access in the menu to to do a lot more with those effects some other features you have uh, it has a trigger in so if you have an external drum machine like an old 808 or something or any old analog gear that has a trigger you can actually put it into this thing this will sync to that trigger. This has both CV and gate out, so if you have some modular gear, you can use this to control your modular gear. It has a USB port as well as DIN MIDI. Uh, the USB has both MIDI on it as well as audio. It has an audio interface. It will play the sound of the synth engine as well as the sound of the audio input. So if you want to use this to plug your guitar into and you can record your guitar because this will appear as an audio interface in your DAW, which is great. What's not so great is that in typical Roland style, and I have no idea why they do this, they do this on all their synthesizers, the MIDI in the USB works differently than the MIDI in the DIN. Uh, there's a few little things. The one that just drives me insane is the way arpeggios work. When you send uh, MIDI data to the keyboard over DIN. Uh, if it's arpeggio on, it plays the arpeggio, or if it, or it's the other way around. If you send it via MIDI, it plays one of them. It plays the arpeggio, and one of them it doesn't. And the reverse is also true. If you have the arpeggio turned on here, and you play a chord on the USB, I think it just transmits the chord. Whereas on the DIN MIDI, it actually sends the arpeggio notes. And it just, it's stupid. Why does Roland do this where they just, you know, for no reason make things work differently? And as a result, I actually have this hooked up both with USB and DIN MIDI at the same time. And I have it appearing as two different instruments in my DAW because I need it to work differently depending on what I want it to do. So again, another stupid Roland boneheaded move. And it's not just a system aid. All my rolling gear does the same thing. I don't know why they do that. The SD card, it has an SD card you can plug in the back. Uh, you can do firmware updates with that. Um, you can say, back up the, the synth to that SD card and restore it. Now, what would be really nice, you can export individual patches. So you can take a patch and say, write it out to that SD card. Uh, then you can take that patch, you can name it as a file name on the SD card, and then you can take that patch and load it back in. Now, it doesn't actually write it to a place in the patch memory. It just loads it into the temporary storage as if you were editing it on the knobs. So once you've loaded it from the SD card into the, the synth, you can then say, OK, now write that to wherever you want it to go. 
Um, it's a bit of a pain doing patches one by one like that, especially because you have to adjust the file name by twirling this little knob. You know, you have to like A, dial around to A, next character, and then dial down to N, and then next character. And that's how you got to enter your file names. It's a real pain. Um, the overall backup backs up all the patches. So if I, if I go to System 8 and I want to do a backup, it's going to back up all my patches. I don't have a way of saying, okay, back up these eight patches and restore only these eight patches. So you can store lots of different backups on there and each of them can have a set of 64 patches, but it's really a clunky way of doing things. One of the Achilles heels of this thing is patch storage. It's just over and over and over again. It comes, it, it drives me nuts with how poor the patch storage is on this. One of my big projects is to figure out a way to do sysx patch storage in my DAW so that instead of having the patches stored right here, I can have them stored in my DAW. So when I bring up a project, it just sends whatever patches it needs, uh, you know, depending on what track I'm recording. Um, it's, a, it's on my to-do list. I'm pretty sure you can do it. Uh, I just haven't figured out how yet. As for an editor, there is no official Roland editor for this. Uh, I mean, the setup on the panel is fairly concise and self-explanatory. It's, it's pretty easy to do sound design on this thing. There is a third-party editor for the System 8. I'll put a link to it in the description. It's not free. Um, it kind of sucks. All it does is duplicate the controls that you see on here. For me, a third-party editor or any editor for this thing should have all that, you know, especially for like the effects where there's like all these extra controls that normally you have to go menu diving for. It would be fantastic if the editor just had that right there in front of you. Instead, it just has these same nine knobs. Um, it doesn't make any sense. So why would you go to the, the effort of making an editor and just make it exactly the same as the control panel already is, which is what it is. It does have the capability to load and save patches via SSX. And supposedly you can institute it as a VST inside your DAW and use it to save and load patches. But like I said, I've not got it working. So maybe it can, maybe it can't. Uh, I don't know if you notice, I have uh, aluminum pa end panels on my System 8. It did not come with those. Those are an optional extra. They're made by Roland. They also have wooden ones that you can get. I read recently that the aluminum ones are no longer available. I know the wooden ones still are. I don't know if that's a temporary thing or if they've discontinued those entirely, but it does make it look good and it helps protect it from bashing it around because it is, it is plastic. Uh, the last feature it has, if you have Roland Cloud, uh, I do not. I, I'm not a huge user of, of online cloud services like that, but if you use Roland Cloud, uh, which is how you get plug outs in and out of this thing. Um, you can use this as a control surface for Roland Cloud. So you could literally load an instance of System 8 in Roland Cloud and then use this control surface to control your System 8 instance in the cloud or any other synthesizer that you load in the cloud. All these controls, all the filters, all this stuff are all assigned CCs. So when if I'm recording using this and I, I'm recording MIDI and I adjust a filter, it sends that filter change to my DAW as a CC and, it, and the DAW will play it back. So if I'm sitting here playing something and I adjust the filter down, then I play it back, it does the exact same thing. It plays it and adjusts that filter down without me touching the keyboard, which is really nice.
overall, this thing has unbelievable sound. Just a thunderous sound. The, the bass that comes out of this thing, you can, you can shake the house with the, the, the sounds that come out of this. It can do everything from harsh metallic FM to the warmest, softest pads. And of course, any sound you've ever heard come out of a Jupiter 8 Juno 106 GX3P, this thing does perfectly. And I'm talking perfectly. You can literally buy a book of the, you know, the old books that had patches. Uh, you could buy them in the 1980s and it was books of sounds. And it literally had pictures of the panel and where you put the sliders. And that's how they showed how to do the patches. Well, you can take one of those, put the, the, the sliders and the controls to match what's in that book, and you will get the sound that, that they intended you to hear from that book from the 1980s. Um, the key bed, not bad. It's, it's not the greatest keyboard. It's not the worst. Uh, I did get a weird squeak on mine probably about six months after I got the keyboard. And it was only on the last two keys. Every time I hit it, it was giving a really weird squeaky noise. Um, I'm, I'm going to admit to violating my warranty here. Again, I still have a warranty on this thing, which I hate to do. But OK, I took it apart. Um, I've been working on electronics for upwards of 30 years. I thought I can fix this, I'll, or at least I'll look at it. And I did fix it. All it was, there's the, at the, the edge of the keys, there's a little bit of grease that lubricates how the key actually presses. And apparently, whoever assembled this one didn't put any grease on that very last key, and that's what was squeaking. So I, the, the key next to it had lots of grease, so I just took a little bit of grease off that one, put it on the one on the end, job done, it's fixed. Other than that, I've had no problems with this. Uh, some people hate these green lights. I don't mind them, actually. I kind of like them. I think it's kind of cool. I really like how uh, um, it lights up to show you what parts are actually active. If you hate the green lights, you can turn them off. You can dim them or turn them off entirely, which kind of negates the point of having them there so that you can see what control they're active. I do wish that the actual letters glowed in green so that you can see what everything was in the dark. But, I mean, you can't have everything. A lot of people hate these black knobs as well. They, they replace them with different colored knobs. It's kind of cool where you can say like, okay, oscillators are one color of knob, a filter is another color of knob. So it's easy to group them just by the color of the knobs. That's kind of a neat idea. I doubt I would bother doing that, but lots of people do. There's lots of knobs out there that, that fit. I love this for sound design. It's an immensely capable synth for sound design. The FM capabilities of this thing are off the chart. It's not DX7 FM where you have to work with operators and algorithms. It's more this oscillator is modulating that oscillator uh there is only one algorithm uh well that's not entirely true there are multiple uh, i i promise i wasn't going to get into fm in this okay it's very capable fm you don't have to know a lot about fm programming to do it you can just mess around the knobs and twirl them and and, and stuff the fm functionality of this actually did not come with it when it was first released it was added in a later firmware update that's why all the FM functionality is in these variations. So that's why you'll see like, it'll be variation seven and the knob that used to do the waveform actually now does the ratio and the knob that does this actually now does that. So it, it's kind of a hack the way they put this stuff in there, but it is in there, it works really well. The menu diving, not too heinous. Uh, it's one or two levels deep. And like I said, most of what you need in there You'll go in there, set it once, and forget about it. Unless you're really heavy-duty, hardcore sound design where you're editing really obscure parameters for things. And most people are not doing that. And, and for, I mean, I use this thing all the time. I rarely use the menu. It's really fast and easy for sound design. I can sit down. If I have a sound in mind, I can sit down with this thing. In five and ten minutes, I've got the sound. It's everything. is It's almost controlled per function. The surface is really logical and laid out. It's easy to work with. I really like doing sound design on this unit. There's no bugs. I've not had any problems with this. I've never encountered a crash. It's never locked up. I've never come across something that didn't work the way I expected it to. Um, I can't say the same for at least a couple of my other digital synths. I have a couple digital synths, uh, both of which I have not yet featured on this series and will shortly that uh, at one time or another were not riddled with bugs, but definitely had some bugs. 
I've never encountered a bug on this synth. It just works. It, I would depend on this on the stage because it's reliable. It doesn't lock up. It just works. It plays. It sounds great. Okay, yeah, I totally jinxed myself by saying that. I'm sitting here editing this video literally half hour after I recorded this video saying that I've never crashed my System 8. I crashed my System 8. I was sending in a bunch of arpeggio data. I got it into a MIDI loop between the USB and the DIN MIDI and it just froze. Uh, I was able to, I actually had to power cycle it to get it back and then I tried to do it again to see if I, re if I could replicate it and yes, it froze again. So yes, it doesn't have bugs but if you do strange things to it, you can get it to crash. But other than that, it's reliable. Okay, back to the video. This is not a toy synth. This synth is used by famous musicians. It's used by Jean-Michel Jarre, um, Gary Newman, Howard Jones. I think Howard Jones has like three or four of these on stage. Um, Heaven 17, I know uh, Martin Ware from Heaven 17 has one of these. It's definitely a synthesizer that is reliable in a professional environment. Of course, Howard Jones, you know, he can't haul around all his old Jupiters anymore because they just can't take the beating on the road. So this is a perfect replacement for him. He's got a Jupiter 8 right here. It's light, it's small, he can carry it around. He can carry around spares and they aren't $35,000 a piece. So I hope I've covered most everything about this synth that I can think of. Uh, I hope it, this video was of some value to you. I know it's been a while since I did the last one. Uh, I just knew I had to do a bunch of research for this. Literally, I have to relearn the synth uh, in order to be able to present it to you like this because half the stuff that I don't use all the time, I forget about. So I actually have to crack the manual again and, and relearn the synth, which is kind of the impetus for these videos in the first place is to force myself to relearn these things. But uh, I love this thing. It's this one that I would never sell. If you do like what you saw here, please click that like little thumbs up down below. That really helps us. And also, if you have any questions, if I did I make a mistake? Did I get something wrong? Happens. Leave a comment down below. Do you have a question that I didn't answer? Leave a comment down below. I read every comment. I try to answer every comment. And if you haven't subscribed to this channel, go ahead and do it. Click that subscribe down below and then the little bell next to it. Make sure you click on that as well so you get notifications every time we post a new video. Thanks for watching.